Thank you very much. Well, how would you use this before? So, please. So, what I will actually discuss uh, doesn't have so much to do with dynamics. Uh, uh, the problem is motivated by some considerations from dynamics, so I'll explain that and uh, state what the results are first. But then you will see that uh, once I specify the problem, which will be really, uh, really a problem in number theory about uh, what modular form, then we will really be talking only about Fourier uh, coefficients of modular forms and techniques on handles of number theory. And Specifically, from once you get a number theory to solve it, and the dynamics will kind of disappear. But anyway, let me first uh, tell you what the what the motivation of the problem is. So there are a number of things you could look at, but one kind of problem which many people are interested in is that if you have a if you have a region in the plane, so it could be a stadium like this. So my drawings won't be great. So what I mean by a stadium is that there's kind of a rectangle here, and then at the ends you have some kind of semicircle. So I must have done this. Imagine you're in a region like this, or well, you know, simple things would be a rectangular table like this. Okay. And imagine that you're playing billiards on this uh, on one of these regions. So, so you can imagine that there's a, there's a ball here, and you shoot it in any direction that you want. And then the ball will reflect along the uh, edges of the table, and let's say it travels in a straight line. Um, obeys that angle of incident equals angle of reflection. So you have billiards on a region like this, etc. Or you can play billiards on a region like this, which is more standard. Now, you can notice that there are kind of uh, big differences between a domain like this and a domain like that. So, one thing which is easy to check by just geometry is that if you if you look at the angles that are made by uh, by the trajectory in the rectangular case, there are only two possible angles. You would always be either parallel to this line or parallel to this other line. So you don't have very, you know, you could have a complicated path, but it's not so complicated. In this case, the, the trajectory could be very different. And it, uh, uh, it is, this is an example of something which is called an integrable system, which is quite orderly. And this is an example of something which is more chaotic. Okay. So I don't want to say precisely what these mean. So here I already told you that the set of directions, for example, there are just two directions, which is not the case here. So <coughs> one thing you could understand as what chaotic means is that if I start off with, with a ball and I, and I shoot it in two slightly different directions, you can ask how do the trajectories differ as, you, as time goes on. 
If you play with a rectangle of full table and you shoot them in two slightly different directions, of course we will make a mistake, but for several several bounces, they will stay pretty close to what you want. Here it will start diverging, the two trajectories will start diverging pretty rapidly. That's an example of what chaos is. Now, this is something which is called the, the classical dynamic. And you could think of uh, you know either billiard as we've spoken about, or you could think of a manifold without boundary, in which case you would think of uh, a straight line, and you can see how these straight lines wrap around the circuit. So that would be called the Dirac explosion. Um, so if you take a region like the stadium billiard, where where the classical dynamics is chaotic, or you need some weaker condition like that being ergodic, then people are interested in looking at some kind of quantum mechanical analog of this. And you want to know if there's some way in which this chaos in the classical level is reflected in the, in the quantum level as well. So I should tell you what this uh, quantum analog means. Uh, you think of, instead of thinking of an actual you know, point moving in a certain direction, we are going to think of some some kind of wave function, which is going to be some function of uh, the position and a function of time. And usually you would think of it as uh, being normalized to have L2 norm 1. In the region, say this is the region. So the usual interpretation is that the absolute value of psi squared gives you the probability of finding your point, uh, your particle near the position z, let's say at time t. And then it should be found somewhere inside this region. So, so you, you normalize it so that that probability is one. Then, so there's something called the, the Schrodinger equation, which tells you how these, uh, how these uh, how these uh, phase functions evolve as a function of time, and usually you can say something like the derivative with respect to, to time is given <coughs> by the Laplacian with respect to position. So the Laplacian you could think of as just being, uh, let's not worry too much about the signs, but the Laplacian would be something like the second derivative with x plus the second derivative with y. Well, so one particular case of this, which uh, people are interested in, would be functions where uh, this wave function psi z t uh, doesn't really change with time. So, okay, it could change with time, but I'm interested in let's say, the probability of, which is mod psi of z squared, that's independent of time. One nice way in which that happens is that if your function psi z t, is just behaving like some exponential times uh, something in a function of position. So these are called uh, steady states or eigenstates. Okay. So if you plug that in, into this equation, I'm going to figure out what this means. So maybe I'm missing some minus sign. But what you find is that this means that you're interested in finding a solution to the Laplacian of psi equals something like e times psi. So psi is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. So 
the physics terms, the E is supposed to stand for energy, which is really just corresponds to this Laplace eigenvalue. So if, if you have a complex region like this, we, we know that there's a, there's a discrete spectrum of such eigenfunctions. So there are infinitely many of these. And they would you know, have find, form some kind of orthonormal basis, psi 1, psi 2, etc., with various eigenvalues. With various eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, etc. And the kind of questions you could ask, you could ask a number of questions in this complex. You could, you could want to know how many eigenvalues there are after some high p. You, you might want to know what the distribution of these uh, spaces between eigenvalues are, uh, questions like that, which in general we have very little understanding of what the answer should be. But the question that I'm going to focus on is, uh, uh, is to understand <coughs> How the, how the probability which is mod psi j of u squared is distributed on the region. So, so the interpretation is you're thinking of a of a quantum eigenstate with large with large eigenvalue, which is large energy. And you want to understand if I give you a if I give you a say I'm looking at the stadium Billiard, and if I give you a region in the space like C, I want to know what is the probability that I will find this particle inside the region C, which is the same as saying I want to understand the integral over C of mod psi j of the given square as uh, as the eigenvalue lambda j goes to infinity. Now, all things being equal, the natural guess that you would make is that the probability of finding your particle in, inside C. Should be approximately the area of C as the eigenvalue lambda goes to infinity. Actually, I should say the area of C should be proportional to the area of C, so it should tend to the area of C divided by the area of the total region R. So certainly this makes sense that C is all of R, but you would like to know whether these, uh, these measures psi j squared are getting spread out over the circle. This is kind of a, a simple version of a problem. Uh, in reality, you would not ask for just equidistribution of this, uh, of, of this, of these eigenfunctions just on this, uh, on the surface. Instead, people would consider uh, what is called phase space, where you're interested not just in, on the surface, but also you have a direction that's associated to it. Okay, so you can already see it in this uh, example of these rectangular billiards, where. It may be that the trajectory, the trajectory, trajectory would be equally spread throughout the whole region, but in this case, the angles that it takes, there are just two possible angles. The angles are not getting equally distributed. So you can ask for a more refined statistic than this, but this is, say, one simple version of what the question means. You want to know whether this is true. So this is a conjecture or a guess. Um, very little is known about this conjecture in, in general. So there's a, there is a very general result, which is due to Milman, <coughs> Colin de Verdier, and Lovitch. So this is something which is from the 70s to the 80s. And they did things in various different contexts. And what it roughly says is that when the classical dynamics is dynamics is ergodic, then uh, almost all the time, so for a set of tools, 
olayını tutun. So almost all means that you know you arrange your eigenfunctions and you are allowed to take a set of uh, full density, so 100% of the eigenfunctions, but there could be a small set of exceptions of zero density where it's not really tending to anywhere. And this is called quantum ergodicity. And the problem, the quantum unique ergodicity problem, is does it hold for all items? So actually, what does all mean? It means that can you find an infinite sequence of eigenfunctions where the limiting distribution is something other than this uniform distribution? So are there any other limiting distribution? So in this generality, the answer could be could be no, but maybe yes, maybe no. So there was recently an example which was given by Andrew Hassel for the stadium billiard. So, so that's the start region. And actually, you know, what he shows. Is not for this version as I stated, but for the version in K space. So I'm not so I'm lying a little bit in the statement of this result. And what he says is that if you take a, a typical stadium, so, so you can fix the, the width of this uh, of this rectangular region to be one, sorry, the height of it to be one, and then you could kind of vary the width of it. And if you take a, a generic width, then you show that uh, the answer need not be just equidistribution. So it's a few degrees forward from this case. And the idea was that there is actually one one billiard that you can you can kind of see in this case, if my lines were actually parallel to each other, where where it doesn't get uh, it doesn't get spread out. Namely, if I take a ball and I just uh, bounce it, you know, perpendicular to the side, it's kind of just going to bounce up and down. And you can you can kind of jack this up. You can write down a function. Which is basically a function of two variables. It's uh, separated into a function of, let's say, x and a function of y. Say some function phi of x times maybe sine of y, something sine of n times y, let's say. This is some kind of rough idea of what, what it's supposed to be. Then you can see that if I differentiate this twice with respect to y, I kind of get an eigenfunction back with an eigenvalue which is like n squared. Just differentiate sine twice. If I differentiate with respect to x twice, I get something funny, but there's no n involved. So, so this this kind of looks almost like an eigenfunction. And then you can kind of use this example. This is not really an eigenfunction; it's called a, uh, a quasi eigenfunction or a quasi mode. And you can kind of uh, you know modify this example to show that there must be a genuine eigenfunction around the side. With eigenvalue around n squared, for which something strange must be happening. If you take a function like this and psi is just supported by short intervals here, that measure is not getting spread out. There will be parts of this build, parts of this region which are not touched at all. Okay, like it can only live inside this region, and these regions are empty. Now, so that's one example of where the answer is negative, but there's a case where so in the 90s, Rubik and Sarai that if you look at a manifold, say compact, you 
with particularly negative curvature. So the negative curvature kind of is some indication of chaos. It, it ensures that the agonic, the, the geodesic flow of these manifolds is, uh, is very chaotic. So you might expect that that has some implication on how the eigenfunctions behave. That's uh, so they made this conjecture based on uh, some some evidence, you know, but very very limited evidence in some ways, and also based on numerical calculations where it seems to be true. For the billiard, people knew from numerical calculations that you know these bouncing ball modes would, would persist and the theory may not be true. But here there is strong numerical evidence that this, this is probably true. But again, not so much progress has been made on this on this question, so there's only uh, one general result, which is due to Anantar Alman. <coughs> this is good because I'm probably one of the few people who can actually pronounce the name. <laughs> so, so uh, she proved that uh, you can't quite say something like this, but uh, uh, but in this situation, she showed that any limiting measure. Positive entropy or have some component of that. So I think we will learn more about entropy from uh, Manfred Stock, but I won't say anything much about this. But what, what, what it means is that you can, you can think of how badly can, can these measures be. You could say, you know, can they be just concentrated on some extremely small subregion? Maybe they just all live on some curve inside this region. Some, lower dimensional uh, manifold there. And positive entropy is some kind of statement which says that they can't concentrate on extremely small regions. But apart from this, we, there's uh, only one, there's a few cases in which we have made progress on on this QE, and this is in what I call arithmetic situations. So, so here I'm going to I'm going to now restrict to uh, surfaces. So, so instead of looking at all Manifolds of all dimensions, we're only going to look at the dimension 2k for surfaces with constant curvature of minus 1. So these arise as quotients of the upper half plane. And gamma is a it's a discrete subgroup. Of SO2R. So SO2R acts on on the upper half plane by Mobius transformation. So this P is a matrix A, B, C, D. And you're looking at these quotients by a discrete subgroup. And we would do want these quotients to have uh, finite finite volume. So, so recall also that on the upper half plane, we have the we have the area element, which is given by dx dy or y squared. So this is what's invariant under the action of G, in the action of S of R. And we want H mod gamma to have finite area. So this is kind of a big reduction of this uh, of this general theory problem, but this also is not uh, is not something we can solve. So we make one further reduction, which is that we want gamma to be uh, 
Dann alles korrekt. Okay, I'm not going to say precisely what it is, but for me, gamma is from now on is going to be SO2Z, which everyone can kind of see is something which is arithmetic. So these are matrices A, B, C, D with A, B, C, D being integers. So Manfred will talk about, so this is a situation where A mod gamma is a, uh, is of finite area, but it's not compact. We will draw the sum of the domain for it in a minute. But there are also other cases. So there are also congruence groups. And then there are also groups coming from quaternion algebra. Where, and in this case, the quotient is actually compact. And uh, this is what I think Manfred will mostly concentrate on. Yeah. Sorry. So at any rate, I, I will stick to SO2Z sort of and he may tell you more about this. Okay, so what is the problem for, for in, this, in this case? I can now be more specific. So we have well, so when we're looking at H mod gamma, and we all know what this looks like, it has a fundamental domain like so. This is uh, between minus half and half, and this is the curve mod V equals one. Um, I have to identify this edge with uh, that edge and I'm part of this arc with that. So, and of course, you can see that this, uh, this fundamental domain is not compact, but its, uh, its area, we can compute what the area is. This is just a calculus exercise, it's uh, uh, pi over 3. So I'm interested in saying something about functions that live on that live on this uh, on this quotient, and uh, I'm interested in eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So the Laplacian here is going to be the hyperbolic Laplacian, which is minus y squared times the second derivative with respect to x. So we are interested in fun nice functions on this space. Which are going to be eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So let me recall a few more things. So, so this space or the space of functions on here has a nice, you know, it's a nice inner product space. Well, the inner product is given by if I take two functions uh, f and g, the inner product is just the integrate f of g, g bar of g, with the measure dx dy over y squared. And uh, the Laplacian is self adjoint with respect to this inner product. Now you might ask. We want to look at eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. With the L2 norm. First of all, it's not uh, completely clear that these things exist. So, if you if you think of it just as solids and differential equations, uh, one can show that if you're in a compact region and you're looking at and you're trying to solve uh, fine eigenfunctions of a Laplacian, that those exist, and there's a discrete spectrum of these. But this region is not compact, and so why should there be any eigenfunctions of a Laplacian at all? 
which are spread into the middle of the space. Uh, it's not an obvious fact. If you take a generic portion, maybe these things just don't exist at all. But there is a there is a nice result. So, so this you know existence is not obvious. But we do know that these exist thanks to the work of Silbert uh, and, and Marx from, from the 40s. So, so let me recall for you what, what these results said. So there are so if you if you suppose you look at all functions on this fundamental domain and you want to get some kind of uh, spectral theorem for it, you want to find a nice basis of functions on the space in doing which you can decompose all the functions that live there. Uh, there is such a spectral decomposition, and it consists of three parts. One is the constant eigenfunction. So if I normalize my constant to have uh, L2 norm 1, so the constant really should be square root of 3 over pi, which when I square out and integrate this will be 1. Then there are objects called mass forms. So these are Precisely, you know, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian with eigenvalue lambda j, and which re decrease rapidly in the cusp. So, which means, for example, that as y goes to infinity. And the third Category of these are Eisenstein theories. So these are non holomorphic Eisenstein theories. You could start by thinking of these as, uh, as sum over all elements in gamma modular gamma infinity. This is uh, uh, the set of matrices 1 and 1. And B. So these are your. The usual way in which you might define holomorphic Eisenstein theories, except that here I would take the imaginary part of gamma z and raise it to the power x. So in case three, you're looking at uh, so that series is absolutely convergent for the real power that's bigger than one, but it has an analytic continuation. So, so this is the first set of guys, B, Z, after that. These are not square integrals. So the square integral guys are just the, the mass of forms and the constant of this. So, so let me just say this is a this is a point that I was come back to in the later lectures, what it means to have a spectral decomposition is that I can take, you know, so there's a theorem which says that I can take any function f, a function on, on h mod gamma, and I can expand it into uh, its inner product with a constant function Times this constant function square root of 3 over pi, plus the sum over all the 
eigenfunction cj of the inner product of f to the eigenfunction cj, cj, plus some integral, uh, maybe I'll be missing some factors of e pi, etc., some inner product of the eigenstein theory. So if you, you know, the way you should think about this is that this is kind of like a Fourier series and Fourier integral. So if you have a nice function on R and you want to take some kind of special expansion for it, you have the theory of the Fourier transform, you would be able to write as a inner product of the functions with e to the i t c, which is not an open function, it's not uh, spread integrable, but nevertheless you can write down Fourier, Fourier transform. So this part corresponds to some kind of a Fourier transform, and this corresponds to the, the Fourier series side. You can write a function which is periodic with theta one as a inner product of the exponential e to the i and theta with e to the i and theta. Okay. So, so think of this as Fourier theory, and this is Fourier Fourier transform. We'll come back to this stuff later. And the good place to look for for information about this is stuff if I need to work on spectral methods. So returning to the theory problem, the problem is to look at is to take a mass form P of large eigenvalues. And the question is if I give you a region C. Inside the fundamental domain, that's the integral over C of mod P squared converged to the area of C, of C divided by the total area of the star pi over C. So, again, this is kind of a, a simplified version of the custom. Uh, the real version of the custom is to, is to take C and to lift it to a function. So this, this is living on H mod gamma, and you would lift it to a function on, on the phase space, which in this case is going to be SL2R mod SL2. So which is one dimension higher. And again, this uh, this lift is called a, a microlocal lift, and I think uh, Manson will discuss uh, how this is actually constructed. And then you're asking for a distribution in a, in a, in a bigger range. Okay, so this is as the eigenvalue goes to infinity. And so here we can actually state the theorem. Uh, almost, uh, I will state the theorem with an asterisk and then kind of explain what the asterisk is uh, in a little bit. But basically, the theorem is that this is true. And this is uh, largely due to Elon Rubenstrauss. So again, uh, I see that we'll be discussing how the proof of this result goes. And what Rubenstrauss showed was that the only possible limiting measures Is a constant times uh, three over pi times p x p y over y squared. So this measure three over pi times p x p y over y squared would be would correspond to a uniform distribution just getting spread out over the whole region. But there could be a constant here. This constant could be between zero and one. So let's think about what this means. You have you have a sequence of uh, probability measures, and you're asking, you know, what what do they converge to, and how can a sequence of probability measures converge to something which is not a probability measure? Well, 
your region is compact, of course, that can't happen. There will all any sequence of probability measures has to converge to a converge to a probability measure. But our region is not compact. So what could be happening is that as you as you go along your sequence, more and more of the mass is escaping off the infinity, and then there's kind of very little mass which is left in any compact region that we start that we start our region. Okay, so so there could be some escape of mass. And, and I showed uh, last year that, that there is no escape of mass. <coughs> so maybe I will say something about this result at this time, but, but I will explain. Um, I won't explain much about this particular problem, but I'll talk about something closely connected to it, and that will also help me explain what this asterisk means. So to say, so let me change uh, the problem a little bit, and uh, now explain something which is uh, maybe more familiar to, to some of you. Uh, here we are thinking of functions which are which are quite nice. So they are functions f from the upper half plane to c, which satisfy a beautiful property. They satisfy that f of gamma z is the same as f of z for all gammas in f of z. This is kind of a very nice property, but it turns out that there are not so many nice functions which satisfy it. Uh, the price we paid for it is that we didn't want to say that f was polymorphic or anything. We forgot about the complex structure, and we only wanted that f should be some real analytic thing, some eigenfunction of the Laplacian. You can ask a different question if you're interested in polymorphic functions. Which, you know, depending on your case, you might think are better than these eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. These are also eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, the eigenvalue is just zero. But if you ask them, if you ask, want them to you know, transform nicely, the f of gamma z should be f of e, then of course there are not so many of these. But we can instead ask for something like f of gamma z is a modular form of weight k, so it's cz plus z to the k times f of z, for gamma being some matrix a and c. And this is the classical theory. Of weight k modular form. K is an even integer. And I'm just going to stick to full level SLPD. So, so here we know. So again, there is a there is a nice inner product on this page. You can take two modular forms of weight k, and you could define the inner product So when you act on f by by some element gamma. Or you know you will pick up these powers of cz plus e, cz plus e to the two k. But when you think of how the imaginary part of gamma z changes, right? If the imaginary part of z is y, you can check that the imaginary part of gamma z is just y over cz plus e squared. So what the way you transform an f and the way you transform a g precisely will kill off the way in which this y to the k transforms, and this definition makes sense. So this appears on the product on the space. Of course, the inner product makes sense provided f and g, at least one of f or g, is not too big if it's uh, decreasing rapidly as y goes to infinity. Because they are getting multiplied by this y to the k. And that's the theory of trust forms. So the integral is just okay. So this 
start uh, the two features rapidly. So here, let me write down the example which everyone would have seen of the cusp form, which is Ramanujan's delta function uh, t times. Which certainly is modular and also decreases rapidly as uh, as db goes to infinity. So now the question, which is the analog, the holomorphic analog of QE, I have to let some parameter go to infinity. So I'm going to let k go to infinity. And I take a cusp form which I normalize of weight k, and I normalize so that the speed of the norm is one. So the integral of mod x squared y to the k dx dy over y squared. Then the question is. Same as before, if I restrict to a subregion C, and if I integrate this mass, does this converge to the area of C divided by the area of the full function of the domain? Now, if I state it like this, the answer is, uh, is obvious. So it's obviously no. So okay, let's take our favorite function delta and you raise it to the power k. That has weight 12k. I can normalize it so that it's L2 norm is 1. So you multiply by a constant. Normalize it. And then you're still asking if I look at the distribution of delta to the k on my fundamental domain, is it going to get evenly spread out over the fundamental domain? And of course it's not, because if I take a fixed function and keep raising it to a large power, it will just pick up where the function has a maximum, and that region will get amplified, and everything else will just die off. So as k goes to infinity, this will just concentrate to a point, the point where point of points where delta takes its maximum. So clearly not the case should be. So why does this happen? The point is that the set of the space of modular forms of weight k It's pretty big. It's a vector space of dimension about k over 12. And it has pretty crazy elements like, like delta of to the k over 12. So you, surely in, in a, such a big space, you should not hope to get any kind of vector distribution because I can just basically perturb the coefficients any which way I like, and maybe I'll be able to find some guy who is really bad. But what I should ask is, you know, can we find a nice basis of the space which gets like this? And there's a natural one which suggests itself. Which is the Hecker basis. So, so this is kind of where the arithmetic comes in in these, in these special portions, is that one distinguishing feature of them is that they have a they have a large family of 
commuting self adjoint operator. So let me just uh, recall what they are. Uh, my notation for these might be a little bit different from what you might see, but let me just, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but let me just write down, I think, what I want to use. So all this difference is the is a way I've normalized it by dividing this power up into the k plus one of the two. It's normalized so that uh, my hecka my hecka eigenvalue will be small. The eigenvalue of t should be smaller than t. So I'm on the I'll maybe review this a little later. Next time. So the, the hecka operators commute with each other, they satisfy this relation. They're also self adjoint with respect to this uh, Peterson inner product. So you can find a, a basis of simultaneous eigenfunctions for all the Hecker operators. And the theorem in this case, which is proved by uh, Kolowinski and me, is that if, if f is a, it's a Hecker eigenform, and as k goes to infinity, The integral of uh, mod x squared y to the k dx plus t y over one squared does converge to uh, t over pi times the area of c. So again, f is L2 normalized, you have L2 norm one over the whole over the whole quotient. So let me state a, a very nice corollary of this, which was uh, Proved first by, by Rudnick. So Rudnick noted that if you had this theorem, then there would be the corollary that you could say something about the zeros of that. So, so f is just a, a modular form of weight k. So you can find out how many zeros it has. So f has about k over 12 zeros in a fundamental domain. And these zeros. Are equidistributed. On the fundamental domain with respect to the measure uh, dx dy. So that's the theorem of the, the polymorphic case. I want to take one more minute to explain uh, that when I stated the result for mass forms. There was an asterisk which I did not explain what it was. So the asterisk is it's the same condition here. The mass form case. We want to find, we want to choose mass forms PJ, which are also eigenfunctions of all the heck operators. Okay, the Hecker operators are the same as what I what I wrote down before. Just put k equals zero. There's no weight involved. So take k equals zero. That's the same Hecker operators. They act on the space, and you can simultaneously diagonalize all the mass forms to get eigenfunctions of all of these. So here, there is a very nice conjecture here, uh, but seems completely hopeless. That 
the, the spectrum of the Laplacian is simple. So in each eigenvalue appears only one. The eigenspaces are preserved by the heck operators. So if this condition is true, I don't need the asterisk. Every every mass form would automatically be an eigenfunction of all the heck operators. But we don't know, we don't know that. And then so in the next few lectures, I'll explain something about the proof of this theorem with uh, Dr. Solovinsky. And the main thing that, uh, the, the, that makes these proofs work is these are these heck operators. So they give a particular multiplicative structure, which is very useful. Thank you. Yes, you can you can formulate the same conjecture where you vary the level and keep the weight same. Ah, so what you could do is you could take so your fundamental domain keeps getting bigger. You could project the fundamental domain back to SL2Z. And then, and then you can ask uh, now that n goes to infinity, it's gonna get the biggest condition. Uh, I think the proof should work similarly, but I don't think anyone has any trouble. You can take a congruent group and then set the weight goes infinity and then it should behave. 